Hello mind mappers and welcome to the video. Today we're going to be going over the philosophy of cognitive behavioral therapy by Donald Robertson. Now this is an amazing book looking at how stoic philosophy and modern day therapy actually overlap in a lot of different ways. Donald has done an amazing job in this book not only using his traditional therapy, but also bringing in some of the wisdom from the ancient Stoics as to how we can use certain exercises, certain practices, certain meditations in our own life to overcome some of the problems that we tend to have in modern day society. Things like procrastination, things like uh, unhappiness, unfulfillment, not feeling like you have a purpose, all of these things, we have a ton of really great exercises inside the book. And what I've done with this mind map is essentially broken down what I believe to be the most important points of the book. You can see that I have certain points here and two of them are yellow points. Those are the points that I believe to be the most impactful from the entire book. So without any further ado, let's get into the introduction. The first quote that I pulled from the book to give us an overview of what we might be learning today goes like this. There is an important sense in which psychotherapy, even as we know it today, can trace its root back much further, perhaps all the way back into prehistory, before such ideas were committed in writing. So you can see that we're already getting into the overlap between Stoicism and ancient philosophy and modern day therapy. Modern psychotherapy, especially in the form of cognitive behavioral therapy, or CBT as it's known, the most modern of our contemporary schools, can also be viewed as part of an ancient and therapeutic tradition derived from the informal phil philosophical circle surrounding Socrates, and therefore stretching back to Athens in the 5th century BC. Of the various schools of Socratic philosophy, the one that bears the strongest therapeutic orientation is undoubtedly Stoicism, especially that of the later Roman schools. According to Galen, physician to the Stoic Emperor Marcus Aurelius, Sisyphus, one of the founders of Stoicism, emphasized the role of philosophers as that of a physician of the soul, someone who we would now refer to as a psychotherapist. So before psychotherapy was even a thing, you can see that the Stoics and the ancient philosophers really viewed themselves as that physician of the soul. And really what I wanted you to pull away from this introduction is that ideas last for centuries for a reason. How many books, articles, or schools of thought today are likely to still be used centuries from now? especially with the amount of content that is going out there online nowadays, it's likely to say that there's not going to be very much alive in the next 10 years, not let alone the next few centuries. Lately, I've been on a really big Stoic kick. I just think it's fascinating how applicable some of the Stoic teachings are to modern life. This passage here made me think about how a lot of the books we might read or ideas we might encounter won't make it until the end of the day, let alone centuries. So why has the philosophy of the Stoics withstood the test of time? The centuries of other ideas, cultural change, and the potential to get lost. And actually, side note, a lot of the Stoic teachings actually did get lost. We're just kind of going on the few that were able to be salvaged or, or found. Um, continuing on, I believe that it's because there's something innate in human psychology that they found. Actually, if you think about it, who better to find that innate human piece of psychology than the Stoics? These people were living in a time with much less distraction, but arguably more hardship. That sounds like the perfect environment to not only come up with, uh, but to test an amazing time-tested philosophy. So what's inside this book? What are we going to learn? Again, Donald has done an amazing job at giving us a look into two different but overlapping disciplines. Inside, we'll look a little bit about how each discipline with certain modern day techniques deals with certain modern day problems, sorry, and at the intersection of both philosophies. As always, I have pulled out some amazing exercises from the book and practices for you to take away from the book as well. So if you want to, the best way to use these practices, the best way to learn from these mind maps is actually to follow along. You can find the process of exactly how I mind map plus all 50 plus mind map templates that I've done on the channel, all available at the link down below. Following along with these mind maps is going to help you learn more, remember better, and apply these books to your life. 
our first main point from the mind map is Librarian Warrior. Recent decades have seen growing interest in a movement called philosophical practice and other attempts to promote philosophy outside the academic institutions as something the ordinary people do in cafes or apply to their own life problems in the form of individual counseling or group sessions with quasi-therapeutic style. Even many academic philosophers appear to crave, quite understandably, a return to the days when philo philosophical discourse was meant to be rooted in corresponding behavioral and emotional transformation, and not merely an academic pursuit, abstracted from any practical application. And quite honestly, if you're here watching this video, this is what you're trying to do. You're trying to take this, learn this, these teachings from these philosophies and apply them to your own life. The ancients conceived of an ideal philosopher as a veritable warrior of the mind, a spiritual hero akin to Hercules himself. But since the dem demise of the Hellenistic schools, the philosopher has become something more bookish, not a warrior, but a mere librarian of the mind, not something that I personally want to be. So what's the true meaning of a philosopher? That's what I believe this quote is really getting at. In the days of the Stoic philosophers, they were directed to not only theorize and philosophize, but to actually step into the arena. Whether it was testing the ideas in your everyday life, becoming a real warrior, or even as an emperor, as exampled by Marcus Aurelius. The Stoics understood that no philosophy was worth its salt if it hadn't been tested in the outside world. And as Donald points out here, today we have a tendency to be a little bit too academic with our ideas testing in labs rather than in real life. Although he does also say that there's a growing interest in this movement where we're going to bring f uh, philosophy into our everyday lives, and I'm definitely a part of that. But we don't have to live like that. Now, we see the stoic way of living our philosophy, testing out our ideas, teachings, and strategies, and instead of pitting them against each other in the arena of the mind. So what I've done is I've developed a little challenge for you. Pick something from this mind map, an exercise or a strategy, and test it out. Try it and ask, what do you think will happen and what's actually happened when you use that thought pattern, that strategy, or that principle? This is really why I love coaching. Essentially, this is what we're doing in a coaching session. Together, we come up with a theory or a strategy, or perhaps we borrow a strategy from one of the ancient Stoics or another philosophical teacher the strategy is meant to overcome a problem that you might be having. And then we set out testing it, learning along the way. See, we're not librarians. Together, we're warriors. And I want to buy you $100 worth of coaching. I think everyone needs to experience it at least once. Coaching has absolutely changed my life. If you go down to the link below this video in the description, you can click it and I'll buy you $100 of free coaching with me. I hope to see you there. Our next point is called Stoic Roots. Cognitive behavioral therapy is a predominant school of modern evidence-based psychological therapy. As the name implies, it employs both cognitive and behavioral intentions. Unfortunately, the name belies the fact that CBT is concerned with helping clients to deal with irrational or disturbing emotions and to cultivate rational, healthy, and proportionate ones in their stead. The terms cognitive and rational also seem to suggest in people's minds that CBT must be a form of rationalizing or that it neglects emotion, intuition, or practical experience. However, in this sense of the word, CBT is probably anti-rationalist and an emphasis upon the value uh, it emphasizes uh, upon the value of behavioral experiments and empirical observations. In other words, CBT emphasizes that, insofar as it is reasonable to do so, beliefs should be tested out in practice, in the laboratory of our own personal experiences. So this is something that I actually, I, I, I always thought that therapy was just talking about your feelings. Before I started to get therapy myself, before I uh, moved into coaching and moved into this realm of philosophy, I really thought that people were just getting on the phone and talking about their feelings. And little did I know that instead it's actually made up of three main tenets. Cognitive activity affects behavior, so your thoughts affect your behavior. Cognitive activity may be monitored or altered, so you can change your thoughts. 
and desired behavior change may be affected through cognitive change. So essentially what therapy really is, is just the reverse of what most of us end up doing. We want to make a behavior change, we want to adopt a new habit, and instead of changing our thought patterns around that particular thing, what we end up doing is trying to force ourselves into habits. And it's no wonder that so many people have such a difficult time trying to get themselves to adopt new habits. Epictetus once said, of the things that are in, uh, of things, some are in our control and others are not. This is mirrored in modern day CBT by showing us that we should aim to control the things that we can and be indifferent to the ones that we can't. That's really a core tenet of both stoicism and of therapy. That being said, both the Stoics and the CBT put a huge emphasis on watching your thoughts and watching what they're doing. Then working to change your thoughts you're having in order to change your behavior. Rather than what most of us do, which again, seems like the other way around. And quite often, this can be why we get ourselves stuck in a rut of behavior change. It's kind of this negative cycle that a lot of us end up getting into where we try and change our behavior, but because we haven't changed our thoughts, we end up going back to doing the same behavior before, and then our thoughts end up beating us up and we do the behavior even more. I know, for example, I was uh, addicted to food at one point in my life, and this describes food addiction absolutely to a T. So essentially what would happen is I would decide that I was gonna start a new diet. And with starting that new diet, I would do a little bit of restriction. But the whole time that I was restricting, which is what you're supposed to do on a diet, you're only supposed to eat certain things at a certain time uh, in a certain amount. And what I would end up doing is restricting, restricting, restricting. And all my thoughts were about restriction. All my thoughts continued to say, oh, you can't eat that or, you know, any, any kind of derivation of that thought. But what ends up happening is because you're restricting so much, eventually the thoughts just want to go back to where they were before. And thus begins kind of that binge and restrict cycle that a lot of us are falling into. It wasn't until I started to pay attention, be aware, and look at my thoughts until I was actually able to get out of that binge and restrict cycle. I'm happy to say that I haven't been in that binge and restrict cycle for quite a few years now. And that was not an easy task. I probably struggled with that for the majority of my adult life until I was able to overcome it by looking at my thoughts first. Just goes to show you how important it is to be able to have someone that can identify and help you with changing your thoughts along the way, which is what uh, a stoic philosopher would do, a modern day therapist would do, and perhaps even a modern day coach, given that it's within their scope of practice, would be able to do with you as well. Now, we've come to our very first highlighted point, which is eudaimonia. And if you've ever read any Stoic philosophy, you know that this is a very important word to the ancient Stoics. The ideal state of the human mind is not irrational indulgence in mere sensory pleasure, which is what they would call hedonism, therefore, but something known as eudaimonia, a Greek term that encompasses rational fulfillment, happiness, and well-being. If daemon was taken to simply mean mind, the word eudaimonia could literally be translated as meaning mental health. Although this does fail to do justice to the metaphysical connotations of the Greek word, which can also be taken to mean being uh, on good terms with one's inner daemon or guide, a concept not unlike the Christian idea of conscience. In any case, the cardinal virtue or quality, arete, that contributes to eudaimonia is simply wisdom, or if you prefer, it could be translated as meaning philosophical enlightenment. You can see that there's a lot of different words that all different religions, school of thoughts, and etc. are using, but what we're looking for in life is eudaimonia. Knowing this leads us to value and pursue the cultivation of human wisdom above all else, which is illustrated in every word, in the very word philosophy, the love of wisdom. Philosophy in this concrete sense, the everyday pursuit of wisdom, is therefore defined as the art of living, the highest human purpose. Through different schools of ancient philosophy, though different schools of ancient philosophy differed on their interpretation of specifically how this was to be put into practice, it should be evident that for Socrates and the Stoics, 
The notion that the goal of human life is to pursue wisdom does not equate to saying that the meaning of life is that one should spend it reading books on philosophy, but rather that one should strive for practical wisdom in facing everyday challenges. So this is very interesting, this kind of concept of gathering wisdom, gathering knowledge without spending your entire life reading books. And you'll, you'll notice that Stoicism is so much about using the knowledge that you have in everyday life. And that's really what I'm aiming to help you guys do with these mind maps as well, is not spend all of our time pontificating on points about uh, academic or uh, any, any different type of um, statistics and that sort of thing. What we're trying to do is how can we apply this stuff to our lives? So this whole concept of eudaimonia is all about hedonic pleasure versus the stoic eudaimonic joy. So hedonic pleasure, again, is sensory pleasure coming from things like food, sex, and praise. The Stoics didn't view these as inherently bad, as some poor translations might lead us to believe, but instead they viewed excesses of any of these things as unwanted, for many different reasons. Not the least of which is that this type of pleasure cannot be sustained. This is where the word hedonic treadmill comes from. Essentially, you get on the path towards continually indulging in these hedonic pleasures and you can never get off and it never has really a fulfillment involved in it. Instead, the Stoics told us that we should aim for the state of eudaimonia, which is the pursuit and cultivation of human wisdom. This to me is something that most self-help or personal development books tend to neglect. It doesn't give you an imaginary end to search for, but instead it allows you to fall in love with the process of cultivating wisdom. So a lot of us have this idea that when I'm successful, I'll be happy. When I get this new job, I'll be happy. When I can adopt this new habit, I'll be happy. But what Stoicism allows us to do, or Stoicism encourages us to do, is to fall in love with the minute-to-minute -minute state of eudaimonia. Moving towards developing wisdom, developing our philosophy, developing our knowledge, developing our resolve, our judgment, and all of these different qualities. And when we do that, we can really focus on the process rather than focusing on an imaginary end. So eudaimonia is a major cornerstone in Stoic philosophy and one I have worked very hard to cultivate in my own life. Eudaimonia doesn't just come, as many think happiness might, but it really needs to be worked on. For many years on my journey, I was searching for an end place, a place of pure happiness, productivity, or whatever I happened to be searching for that day. I'm sure a lot of you can absolutely put your hand up and say, this is either me right now or has been me in the past. The concept of eudaimonia and the pursuit of wisdom has allowed me to not only slow down, but to also work on being detached from the outcome. For me, this is the first place that any personal development journey should start, and it's why I made this a highlighted point. This stuff is hard, as in personal development is very hard, and beating yourself up for not being perfect, letting go of your ego and telling yourself that you're better than you are, or jumping from lesson to lesson without application are all major roadblocks that a lot of us stumble on. Do you feel like you're hitting any of those roadblocks right now? Again, I want to invite you to click the link down below. I'll buy you that coaching session. This is a really good place to start. If you're having trouble being detached from the outcome, you're finding yourself jumping from thing to thing and not realizing or being happy and fulfilled with any of the things that you try, getting a coach can be a really great place to start because practicing eudaimonia is a very difficult endeavor. Nonetheless, it's worthwhile. The next point we're going to talk about is a great strategy. It's called the Reserve Clause. Seneca defines the Reserve Clause by the following formula. I want to do such and such as long as nothing happens which may present an obstacle to my decision. He gives the example, I will sail across the ocean if nothing prevents me, and elaborates, nothing happens to the sage contrary to his expectations, for he foresees that something may intervene which prevents that which he has planned from being carried out. What he thinks above all is that something can always oppose his plans, but the pain caused by failure must be lighter for one who has not promised success to himself beforehand. 
This is exactly what we're talking about in the eudaimonia point just above. A really great exercise that you can try on yourself. I recommend that you take this one out for a test drive. The Stoic, therefore, makes a point of qualifying the expression of every intention by introducing a distinction between his will and external factors beyond his control. The sage thereby holds two complementary positions in his mind simultaneously. Number one is that I will do my very best to succeed. That's focusing on what you can control in the moment. Number two is while simultaneously accepting that the ultimate outcome is beyond my direct control. And that's non-attachment to outcome. Those are the two main things that we're looking to do within this exercise. And I believe that that's the two main teachings that you should take away from this mind map, no matter what. These are the two that you should be practicing. It implies, I will try to succeed, but I'm prepared to accept both success and failure as equanimity, and thereby recognize human fallibility. Centuries later, Christian theologians would signify the same notion by attending appending their letters DV, or Dio Volante, God willing, to their correspondence. Setting goals is a major part of personal development. Nonetheless, it's in every single book. Every single book that you read tells you you need to set goals. But what they don't tell you is about the negative sides of goals. When you're failing to reach a goal, this might happen. You might, for example, if you're attached to the outcome, sometimes you'll quit early when you feel yourself failing. This allows you to save face by saying that you didn't try hard enough. Sometimes you'll outright fail and you'll end up beating yourself up, making it harder and harder to try again, perhaps wasting valuable learning experience. When you're in business or when you're in personal development, failure is the best time to learn something new. But quite often, because we're so attached to the outcome, we don't view it as a learning experience. We view it only as a failure. When you've reached your goal, here's the other negative side. Here's the negative side of reaching the goals that you set for yourself. Maybe you've accomplished something. Congrats. Now your ego has become inflated. Maybe you don't try as hard the next time. Or maybe you believe that you got, uh, maybe you just actually got lucky. You didn't actually try very hard at all or you weren't very good at the thing that you did. But the next time, you won't be so lucky. How will you deal with that if you think that you succeeded because of yourself and not because God was willing? So how might the Stoic deal with these two different scenarios? Bulletproof your confidence by understanding a lot of the process is simply out of our control. Keep your ego in check by understanding how much luck was involved in your victory. Understand that you tried your absolute best, but a lot of it was about luck. You can maintain indifference to outcome because this allows you to focus on the only thing that you can control, the task at hand. And you're seeing quite a lot of overlap between not only cognitive behavioral therapy and Stoicism, but Stoicism and a lot of the teachings of ancient religions and Buddhism and etc. about being focused on what you can control, which is the moment. The present moment is all we actually have access to. Our final point, I want to thank you for being here with me on this mind map, is ready, aim. Begin with the end in mind is one of the seven habits recommended in recent decades by the best-selling self-help author Stephen Covey. It is not a trivial matter to observe that, unlike Stoicism, most classical philosophies, CBT lacks any clear account of the ideal towards which to aim. By contrast, one of the most fundamental techniques of ancient philosophical therapy appears to have been people discussing uh, public discussion in private contemplation and visualizations of the sage and his virtues. This is something that we talked a lot about in How to Be Like a Roman Emperor. It's an absolute staple in Stoic philosophy. I recommend that you check out that book if you haven't already. The Imaginary Embodiment of the ideal role model and the ultimate end or goal of philosophical practice. So again, he talks about with CBT and a lot of other schools of thought, they don't begin with the end in mind. So you want to be aiming for something in particular. And I believe that most of us feel like we're lost today. A lot of the people that I talk to on these coaching calls that I do are feeling just straight up lost. They don't have a path laid out in front of them. 
Sometimes we wonder if maybe it's because we don't have a purpose. Perhaps we are uh, in the wrong place or at the wrong time, we ponder. There's a lot of reasons that our mind comes up with why we're just not feeling like we have a path. But from my experience, I never actually quote-unquote found my passion or got what I was looking for when I changed businesses or got jobs. And this is even a little side note, when I got successful in my businesses, I've had two very successful businesses starting from a very young age and finding my passion and finding kind of the end goal or finding this happiness that it was going along with it never happened from that. It all happened from the inside. Instead, when I started to feel much better was when I adopted this stoic technique, at first without even realizing what I was doing. The concept of the ideal sage is creating an image of your ideal self in your mind and then going about living up to it every single day. And I think this is something that coaches are very good for, it's good that mentors are very good for, people that you're following is very good for. I believe that those people can serve as some sort of an ideal sage for you. You want to try and live up to some of their virtues. You want to be able to accomplish some of the things that they've been able to accomplish. You want to help people at the level that they've been able to help people. That's why I think coaching, mentorships, and YouTube videos are so, so important. Probably more important today than they have ever been. Creating your ideal sage in your mind by acknowledging the virtues of those you admire. This is another little exercise you can take away. First, ask yourself, who do you admire most in your life? What specific virtues do you admire in them and why? Focus in on that every day. I try to do this every single morning. I think about the friends, the mentors, the coaches that I've had, and the things that I want to live up to. I essentially create this ideal sage in my mind and then go about attempting every day to live up to what that ideal sage might do. And at the end of the day, you can try asking yourself, am I living up to my virtues of my ideal sage? How might I have lived up to my ideal virtues today? How could I have done a little better at living up to my ideal virtues? How could I have done, or how did I do very well at living up to those virtues? And what might I do tomorrow to make living up to my virtues just a little bit easier? I think that's a really great way to go about adopting a stoic practice by not beating yourself up but still having a goal in front of you to be able to follow. Thanks so much for being with me here today. This was The Philosophy of Cognitive Behavioral Therapy by Donald Robertson, and I hope to see you in the next video.